Well, welcome everyone to Hope Church this morning. Those here in front of me in the chapel, uh, and also those of you who will be watching this later at home. Particular welcome to David Hercock. It's great to have you back again. Um, we're not here to listen to David, um, as he reminded us uh, in the series, in the, the title for these sermons. Um, it's about listening to Jesus, and that's uh, what we're seeking to do through his word this morning. Just a reminder of our prayer meeting on Wednesday at 7 o'clock. We're going to be ringing around for prayer requests um, through this week. Uh, be encouraged by answered prayer. It's, it's always great to meet together on a Wednesday, and we sometimes hear of how uh, prayers have already been answered. So let's not miss out on that encouragement. Another reminder of the uh, men's convention on Saturday. Great title, Getting Through. Uh, details of that, again, are on the, on the prayer news, and I'll maybe play a little uh, video about that at the end of the service. And the final thing to remind you of, hopefully this is a picture you've all seen before, because you'll have seen it in the prayer news this week. Uh, we've got uh, all those boxes contain 2,222 copies of Beyond the Big C, which is a book that we're wanting to distribute uh, around as much of Gravesend as we can, once some of the restrictions have eased a little bit more. But while we're waiting for that, and we're getting some other stuff ready to go with it, uh, it's an opportunity for us to read the book so we know what we're giving out to people. So we've got, we got plenty of spare copies, and uh, there's some of these on the table by the door. Uh, do pick one of those up, have a read of that. Maybe there's someone you could pass it on to personally that you think would benefit from this. Uh, and um, in, in, the, in the sort of coming uh, months, we'll be talking about how we're going to end up uh, distributing that around. And with that, I'll hand over to David. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your welcome and uh, for the invitation uh, in the first place. Good to be uh, with you again. Let's pray. Let's ask God's help. For God's help, let's bring our praises and worship to him together. Oh Lord, our God and our loving Heavenly Father, as we approach you in worship together this morning, we will remind ourselves of your greatness, your almighty power, sovereign rule over the universe. You are the eternal God who has always been and who always will be. You owe your life and your existence to no one. You need no supply, no support. You are God Almighty. And we bow before you to worship, to acknowledge your greatness and our complete dependence upon you. You spoke and the universe came into being. Your word is powerful. Your creative energy, your imagination. We bow before you in awe and wonder and amazement. We who struggle to think, to understand, to reason, to make things work and to keep things working to order our own lives, to discipline, to love and to care for each other. Oh Lord, we bow before the one who is absolute. We confess, Lord God, our not just our weakness, but our willfulness and our disobedience. How we must offend you in so many ways. Lord God, we would fill our minds with this wonderful, glorious truth about you, that you are, you are love. And for eternity you've, you've loved, and for eternity you will. We thank you for that, the highest expression that we could possibly imagine of love, the giving of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to, to be one of us and to live the life that we, we just cannot possibly emulate, we cannot reach up to, we cannot 
copy, to do things we, we cannot attain to, to live a life of absolute obedience and love and care and goodness and righteousness, but to die a death we dare not face under your wrath, Lord God, because he was bearing our sin. Oh, how we thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for all he, he is and all he ever said and all he ever did and all he is doing now as he intercedes for us, as he unravels and un unrolls the, the future history of the, of the universe and our personal circumstances. We, we thank you that our lives are in such caring hands. Lord, give us a fresh sense this morning, we pray, of forgiveness of cleansing, of being clothed in perfect righteousness. Jesus' is righteousness. Fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. Lift us above and beyond ourselves and help us to know you. Help us to, to, to receive your truth and to receive your love afresh. To be filled with, to the fullness of all that you want to give to us. Bless us, Lord, please, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, where did I put it? Oh, here we are. I couldn't remember which pocket I put it in. How many of you like these things? I'm going to steam up again now, I expect. Oh, maybe my glasses have warmed up enough to... Uh, I don't, I don't like them, but we have to wear them, those of us who are over a certain age and aren't exempt. I, I, can, st I can remember the first time I wore one um, to church, and uh, I smiled at somebody, and uh, looking at their face, they were wearing a mask as well, I thought, what have I done wrong? Because I didn't think they were smiling back. And then I realised, well, actually, perhaps they don't know I'm smiling at them in the first place. And I actually felt quite bewildered by it. Uh, I felt, this isn't right, you know, what have I done? Because I couldn't read their, their face, and, you know, of course, I realised they couldn't read mine either. I got a little bit more used to it now. Uh, tend, you know, look, concentrate much more on people's eyes, which is <laughs> about all you can see anyway, rather than on the, on the, on the mask. Um, so I made up a, I've made up a game, this mask game, and we're going to play it now, okay? What I'm going to do is I'm going to pull a series of faces at you, and you have to guess what face I'm pulling whilst I'm wearing my, my mask, okay? Are you ready? Here goes number one. Okay, got that one? That was number one. I think you know what that one was? I've got them written down here, so I make sure I get them in the right order. Okay, here's number two. <laughs> got that one? I think you know what it was? Here comes number... Do you, what was that one? Straight face. Ooh, nearly. Yeah? Well done! Yes, what was the first one then? Any? Yes. You see it? Just in the corner of your eyes. Okay, here's the next one. Right, what was that one? Sorry? Suspicious. Well, that's a good face to pull, but no, it wasn't that. That one was very cross. Okay, a face you don't want to see too often. All right, here's one you will, you will identify with, I'm sure. Yes! Well done! Well done. And last one. Uh, 
Right, any guesses? No? Well, I'm really glad you couldn't guess that one, because that was a rude face. <laughs> I, <laughs> I shouldn't do this, I know, but I was poking my tongue out. So it's just as well I was wearing a mask, really, isn't it? Because you couldn't see uh, what I was doing. But um, a person's face is, is really important, isn't it? For us to be able to understand what they think of us or how they're talking to us or what kind of a relationship we have with a person. And to see someone smile at you really, really makes a difference, doesn't it? It cheers you up. Almost instinctively, you can't, you can't help but be, feel cheered up, cheered up when someone smiles at you. And one of the most important things to think about is how do we relate, not just to each other, which is ever so, ever so important, but also how do we relate to God? And if we could see God, what would his face be towards us? Or perhaps an easier way to ask the question is if you could see Jesus. If you lived at the same time that Jesus was on earth and you met him, what sort of face would he have toward you? And what sort of face would you have towards him? Here's a verse from the Bible. It says this, 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, where did I put it? I've lost it again. It's here somewhere. Did anyone see which pocket I put it in? Which one? That one there. Trousers. No. Ah, yes, thank you. <laughs> Good job. Somebody's watching it. Someone's got a better memory than I have. When, when we're not a, a Christian, when we're not following the Lord Jesus, when we don't belong to him as one of his special people, because we don't trust in him yet, we haven't given our lives to him yet, we can't see what God's attitude to us is like, probably. And we might assume that, well, of course, God's smiling at me. Of course he is, of course he is. I'm a nice person. I just assume that. But the closer we get to the Lord Jesus, first thing we work out is that actually I'm not such a nice person as I thought I was. You know, we can always find someone who, who's worse than us, can't we? You know, I'm better than the next one. I'm not as bad as that person. But actually, when you get close to Jesus, you realize that the only next person that really matters is Jesus himself. And no one can say, possibly say, um, I'm no worse than him. He's perfect. So the closer we get to him, the more we realise that actually God should be frowning at us or cross with us. But then if we get even closer to Jesus still and start to trust in him, then actually as if God takes the veil away and we can actually see really what his attitude to us is. And when we come really close to the Lord Jesus and really trust him personally, we discover that God is smiling at us. A smile of love and welcome and forgiveness. So can I encourage all of us, myself included, to listen to Jesus, to look to Jesus, to be as close to him as we can, really trust him, be our own saviour and believe that he came into the world to love you, me, and to die for you, for me. And then we will know, we will know for sure that God is smiling, a smile of unending love towards us. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing to know, isn't it? Mind me at the end because I'll read it. Thank you. Um, let's just 
pray for a moment, shall we? Heavenly Father, we know that we deserve your frown, your most cross face. Oh, help us to trust in the Lord Jesus so that we can be absolutely sure that you smile at us, that you love us, that you welcome us as one of your own children. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's come to God in prayer again. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you with praise, with thanksgiving. We thank you for your smile upon us today. It is indeed of your grace that we are here. It is you who has given us life. It is you who keeps us as your people. We can only persevere in trusting you because of your grace. We do so praise you for your faithfulness. We recognize that your mercies are indeed new every morning. And we thank you for how you have kept us over the last year. We thank you for the ways that you have protected us, how we've been protected from illness. We thank you for those who have recovered from illness. We thank you for different needs that we've seen being met over the year. We thank you for different things we've brought to you in prayer where we've seen you provide. We thank you for that. We praise you for your goodness to us. And we thank you, Lord, as we can praise you for the past, we thank you, we can praise you with certainty for the future. Because you are the one who is in control. You are the one who is good. Your ways, your purposes are always the best. And Lord, as we are relieved, we thank you for the, for the prospect of changes in the weeks and months ahead. We thank you for indeed even answered prayer that there are uh, vaccines to uh, control this virus. We thank you for what we call your common grace, which is just so wonderful. We thank you for the prospect of restrictions being eased, but we recognize it's not yet. And we pray again for your help now. We pray that you would sustain us we pray for those who are not able to even join us physically in this way on a Sunday morning. We pray in particular, Lord, that you would sustain them and strengthen them. We pray for those churches that have not been able to meet at all, really, during this whole time. We pray for your uh, protection on your people, to you, for you to bind your people together. And we thank you, Lord, that you have given us all the resources that we need to live for you now. We thank you that Jesus has gone before us. We thank you that he knows what it is to live in a fallen world. He understands frustration. He knows what it is to have plans messed up. He knows disappointment and pain. And we thank you for how we read in your word that it is he who has an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to hear that word today. Help us to see that, that all the instruction that we need is given in your word. It is complete. We pray that you would help us to apply the truth, to, to put into practice things that we know in our daily lives. We recognize we can't control our circumstances, but we can control how we react. And we pray, Lord, that you would keep us, Father, from a complaining and bitter spirit and that you would rather give us a, a Christ-like response that we might seek how we can serve you, how we can honor you in the circumstances that you have placed us in. And we thank you that we are not alone. We thank you that you have given us your Holy Spirit, the one who guides us and changes us, we thank you that it is his presence that is the, the reassurance that we will persevere. And we pray, Father, that you would help us to have our eyes fixed on the future. 
we thank you that Jesus hasn't just come to experience this fallen world, he came to change it. We thank you that in his death he bore the curse of sin upon himself. And we thank you that in his resurrection we see the beginnings of a new creation, of real hope for the future. We thank you that there will be justice. We thank you that wrongs will be put right. We thank you that the suffering will come to an end when Jesus returns. And we pray that you would keep that hope within us. May we long for that day and may you help us to serve you in the light of that now. Lord, teach us today from your word. Help us to truly listen to Jesus and to see that our help is found in him. For we ask it in his name. Amen. Let's turn to the Bible again now uh, and John's Gospel. And chapter 10. We started reading this last week. John chapter 10. Uh, we read the first 10 verses last week, so I want to start off at verse 11 this, this morning um, and read from verse 11 to 18. John chapter 10 from verse 11 to verse 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Well, we look at that, some quite deep stuff in there in the way the Lord Jesus spoke, um, but I hope we'll be able to find it really helpful and reassuring to us uh, this morning. We'll have a song though first. One of the things, well the main thing we're going to pick up is love, the love of Jesus. Um, and this first, this first song is um, Love Before the Dawn of Time. So we'll, should we stand up to identify with the words and think, think through them? Satan's curse lifted through his 
Christ would shine forever, love's unfading splendor, earth and heaven will bow in awe, joining in salvation song. If we were to think of ourselves, of mankind, in the vastness of space and time. It could feel a very, very lonely place if we leave God out of the picture. If you think just the universe is just a random event and there is no one in charge, there is no one at home there is, there is no one creating, sustaining, giving purpose to it all. It would feel a very, very empty, cold, and lonely place to be. Even with uh, some variance of the notion of what God is like, it can still feel very, very cold. If God, is, if God is not seen as a, a relational being, as a loving heavenly father, then the universe is still a cold place, even if there is a God as some would define him, understand him. But the words of the Lord Jesus that we're going to consider this morning uh, show us that at the centre and the origin of the universe is a passionate heart of love. The same John who wrote this gospel wrote other books in the Bible, and I'm sure you, you know that in the first, what we call his first letter, he actually said this, he actually wrote this, God is love. And when we see the universe originated by, centred upon, belonging to, serving the purposes of a being who is himself love, then all of a sudden it's not such a lonely place to be. It's not so empty and cold and dark and purposeless. So, as you know, um, this is a series of talks, three talks in John chapter 10, under the overall title, listen to, listen to Jesus. Because the question that is asked in the very centre of this chapter by opponents of the Lord Jesus, who ask this question cynically, but it is answered by the whole of the chapter, is that very question, why listen to him? Verses 19 and 20. At these words the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, he's demon-possessed and raving mad. Why listen to to him. As I said last week, chapter 9 is centred upon the theme of spiritual sight, and chapter 10 is centred upon the theme of spiritual hear hearing. The question is asked in the centre of it, why listen to him? It is answered throughout the chapter, a whole list of reasons, which is what we're doing on these three Sundays, as to why we should listen to him. Uh, why pay attention to his recorded words in the New Testament? Why go to church on a Sunday to study what he said or what the whole of the Bible says, which is really much the same thing? Um, why, take it imp why make it so important? Why read it yourself at home? Why think about it? Why allow it to control your decision-making? Last time we saw three reasons from the first ten verses because he tells the truth. Listen to Jesus because he tells the truth. Secondly, listen to Jesus because he knows our names. Thirdly, listen to Jesus because he leads to life. Well, this time, um, I want to just look at the next few verses, verses 11 to 8 through 18, and I'll answer the question from there. And I only have one point this morning, but it is a very, very big one. A very, very big one. Why listen to Jesus? Well, listen to Jesus because he loves. Listen to Jesus because he loves. 
Let's start in at verses 11 to 13. Here, Jesus is contrasting himself with other possible teachers or leaders or influencers whom he likens to hired hands. And he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. So Jesus here is contrasting himself as a good shepherd with a hired hand. And he says, well, the hired hand cares nothing for the sheep. But in contrast, of course, what Jesus is saying about himself is that he does care. He does care about the sheep. And it's not surprising, of course, that the hired hand cares nothing for the sheep um, because he's only there for the money. He's part of, presumably part of what is now called the gig, gig economy. He gets paid, I would imagine, a daily wage for looking after the sheep. And uh, if he wants to, uh, to do it, he does. If he doesn't, doesn't want to do it, he doesn't. I'm getting a bit more familiar with the gig economy now because my son has become a Deliveroo cycle uh, delivery boy. Um, and he was out last night uh, delivering uh, around, around our area. And if he, want, if, he goes to work, if he wants to earn some money, he goes, he puts his bag on, his helmet on, his coat on, uh, and his shorts uh, on, and uh, his back, great big box on his back, and he cycles around and picks up uh, deliveries to, to do. It's part of the gig economy. Well, it was a bit like that, I, I would imagine, with these hired hands. So you, wanted to work, probably wanted to work every day uh, to, earn, to earn a wage. And that's the only reason they did it. They, 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 they looked after the sheep, but, <laughs> you know, there, there are limits how far you'd go. And uh, one of the th interesting things about being a deliver deliver Deliveroo drop rider is that you don't have to accept all the jobs that are going. So you say, I don't want to go, I don't want to go cycle that far. You know, leave it to somebody who's on a motorbike or in a car one of those delivery drivers, I don't want to cycle that far, so I won't take that job. There are plenty of jobs going. Uh, that one's too far. I don't like, or I don't want to go to that area, or whatever it might be, so I'll let someone else do that one. You can pick and choose. You know, I'll, I'll go so far to earn my wage, but I won't go any further than that. Well, you can ask yourself, if you were a hired hand, a hired, uh, just a hireling to look after the flock, a flock of somebody else's sheep for a day, and you're going to be paid a certain amount of money, and a wolf comes along, uh, what would you do? You know, I'm not talking about spider here. You know, some of us would run away if a spider came near. I'm talking about a wolf. What would you do? What would you personally do? Well, I think it's quite understandable that, you know, we would run away. Now, it's not what the owner would want, but I think most of us would, would do that. We might put up a bit of a show, maybe throw a few stones... Uh, make a bit of a noise, but if they didn't deter the wolf, then um, we would be off and let the sheep fend for themselves. But what Jesus is saying here is he is really quite different from that. It's extremely different from that. The phrase there, cares nothing for the sheep, um, more literally means this. It doesn't matter to him. That, that is more literally... Uh, what those words mean. The sort of thing we would say, well, I couldn't care less about something. Or, it doesn't matter to me what happens. It doesn't matter to him what happens to the sheep. Now, there's a difference, isn't there, between um, caring for and caring about someone or something. It is possible to care for something or someone that you don't actually care about. If you think about a care home, you know, maybe some who are watching uh, the recording of this, maybe possibly you're in a care home. Maybe several of us have people who are important to us who are in care homes. It's possible to be in a care home, for somebody in a care home to be cared for by one of the carers, but they don't actually care about the person. 
Sadly, that could be the case. You would like it not to be the case, but it could be. They do a professional job of caring for that individual. They do it very, very well, perhaps. But actually, they don't really care about them. It doesn't, it wouldn't affect them personally. They have a professional detachment. And it wouldn't affect them personally, whatever happens to that person. They're, they're, they're just someone that they're employed to look after, and they do a very good job, but they're not personally involved with that person. They don't have a relationship with them. They care for them, but they don't care about them. Well, what Jesus is saying here is this. The, the hireling doesn't care about the sheep. He has no personal investment in them, apart from the fact that he earns money for looking after them. He cares for them, but he doesn't care about them. He looks after them because he's paid to, but he doesn't care about them. It doesn't matter to him about them. So by contrast, what the Lord Jesus is saying is that he does care about us. Not just for us, but about us. And I'm sure it's reminding many of us of another verse of the Bible by, written by Peter, 1 Peter 5 verse 7, where we have this, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Now again, we have the same actual language behind this, the same construction behind this. Because he cares about you, or actually because it matters to him about you. Cast your cares upon him because it matters to him about you. He is involved with you. And if you're hurting, somehow or other, he feels that. It affects God. It affects God how we are. How we are feeling, what, or what is happening in our lives. It matters to him. So, really, the first lesson is this. Listen to Jesus because he loves, and that means he actually cares about us. It matters to him about us. Now, even if some of his teachings are difficult to, to follow, and some of the things he would say to us that we need to listen to and take on board are actually quite hard and quite critical of us, or he's calling us to do things which we find a challenge, you know, to change our behaviour, to change the way we think, to change the way we speak, to change the way we relate to other people, what we do with our time, what we do with our bodies, what we do with our eyes, what we do with our minds, challenging us on those things, even those, he said, because he cares. Now, parents know about this kind of thing, don't they? And Probably children do as well because their parents keep say, saying it to them. And, you know, why do you say this? You know, the child, the child says, you know, why do you insist on this? Why do you tell me off for this? Well, it's because I care. I care for you. I care about you. It matters to me. I don't want you to harm yourself. I want you to be safe. I want you to be truly happy. And it's because I care about you that I have to say things that you don't want to hear. And you don't want to do. So we need to listen to the Lord Jesus. You know, even when he says, well, take up your cross daily and follow me. When he says, that, when he says that's wrong, you know, you must stop doing that. You stop, stop talking like that. You must stop behaving like that. Start doing this. And you say, well, that's really hard to do. Well, listen to him because he cares. It matters to him about you. Now, how do we know that he cares about us? Well, because he gave himself for us. And we're still in verses 11 and 12. We know he cares about us because he, he laid down his life for us. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Now, what would you do if that wolf came? Have you worked it out yet? <laughs> what, what, what would you do? You stand your ground. You take some sort of a risk, but so far, but no further? Would you perhaps take too much of a risk and, and in actually endanger yourself to look after a sheep? Would you even risk dying to protect a sheep or to, to protect the flock? Or if a, if a sheep had gone astray, 
how much time would you spend looking for it? If it had fallen down a steep ravine, how far over would you reach or how far down would you climb? How would you do a risk assessment <clears throat> of rescuing that, that sheep that had gone astray? Would you say, well, I, you know, I'm, I'm prepared to go so far, but no further. You know, health and safety, all the rest of it. Well, what the Lord Jesus says here is that he deliberately laid down his life so that the wolf would satisfy its hunger on him and leave the flock undisturbed. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Doesn't just take a risk for them. Doesn't just go out of his way to protect them. Doesn't just accidentally and unfortunately get mauled by the wolf. But deliberately and purposefully lays down his life for the sheep. So there is the fl here is the flock, there is the wolf, and the, I can't walk around because I think I'm on this mic here. But the, big, the, but the shepherd walks, puts himself between the wolf and the flock, so the wolf gets him and spares the flock. Deliberately laying himself down as a sacrifice to protect his sheep. Now, the Lord Jesus didn't actually flesh out here what laying down his life involved. But we know now, don't we? His point at the time was not to explain about substitutionary sacrifice or atonement or sin-bearing, but rather love. That was his, the point of what he was saying. Listen to him because he really cares for you and he really cares about you. So much so that he died deliberately, laying down his life to rescue us, bearing the wrath of God for us, becoming sin for us in our place. Now, no one else does that, do they? Now, listen to him, he is outstanding. Lots of religions purport to guide us spiritually, but do they rescue? Can they rescue? When the wolf of God's judgment comes, does anybody come to help? Does any religion put it, does any religious leader put themselves in the deliberately in the place of harm in order to keep us safe? Any philosophy of life? Or does it shout from a safe distance how we might possibly rescue ourselves? When temptation comes, does anything else or anyone else draw near with sympathy, having faced intense temptation themselves and won? Jesus does. Or does it, do the others just command us to overcome, be self-disciplined and strong from a safe, detached distance? Or if we belong to an atheistic flock, that denies God exists and denies God's judgment and denies the existence of the devil and denies, the, that denies really the power of temptation. Is it helping us at all? Or is it say, wolf? What wolf? You know, Nelson putting a te telescope to his blind eye apparently. I see no ships. I see no wolf. I see no God to judge. I see no reality of temptation. I see no heaven. I see no hell. Wolf? What wolf? When feelings of lostness and emptiness and pointless, pointlessness come upon us, as perhaps they do from time to time, does anybody else have anything to say or anything to do to help, to comfort, to bring light into the situation, into a legalistic or, or, or li libertine religions of Jesus' day, the Pharisees or the Herodians. Jesus spoke care and compassion and rescue. And to the lonely emptiness of atheism today, Jesus speaks love and truth and hope. 
let's, let's move on. He loves in a way that makes us very, very special to him. He contrasts himself with a hired hand who does not own the sheep. So what he's saying about himself is he is the one who does own the sheep. He is the shepherd, not the hireling. He's the one who, who does own the sheep. They're his sheep. And we are special to him. He owns us. Jesus owns us tw- at least twice over. He owns us by creation. We owe, uh, we owe our very existence to him. And he owns us by redemption if we're his children, his followers. He has rescued us and we, we, owe, we, owe, us, we owe our eternity to him. We owe our time and space to him, but we also owe our eternal existence to him. But the main point he's making here is not so much ownership or possession of us, like a shepherd owns the sheep, but it's more a matter of relationship. If you look at this in the King James translation, it's rendered like this, whose own the sheep are. Now, just as there's a difference between caring for and caring about someone, can you see the difference between saying, I own that, and saying, that's my own? Well, that's the way Jesus speaks about the sheep. Not just a matter of possession, you know, that's my possession, but that's my own. Heard the, uh, have you heard the advert for eBay? You know, you got something you don't want, sell it on eBay. Use the money you get from that sale to buy something you do want. And the, ta- and the, the slogan is, buy, sell, eBay. You know, it's your possession, do what you like with it, sell it, don't care, because you you're fed up with it, don't want it anymore, don't need it anymore, sell it, buy something else. You owned that once, now you own this. And eBay is the go-between. Well, let's go back to the care home again. I'm not sure whether this would be allowed, but let's just play, play a little imagination game for a moment. Someone who works in the care home shows you around. Maybe the, maybe the, the manager of the care home shows you around. Uh, you're thinking of going there yourself or a uh, loved one going there. And the manager takes you around and he or she says, oh, yes, that's so-and-so, gives, tells you their name. Uh, these, these are the needs we've ca- catered for there, and you might find, you know, your loved one would need that, or you'd need that. And goes around a whole load of people saying, yes, that's that, and we, we care for that one, and we care for that one. And, and then you enter the final room, and uh, the manager s- says to you, um, oh, this one's special. <laughs> this one's special. Uh, she's my own. She's my mum. She's my mum. Now, she doesn't mean she's my mum, I own her. I, I, you know, I, she's my possession. She means she's my own. Because she's special to me. She's my mum. She's mine. And she cares for all, everybody the same, I would hope. But this one is, is special. We be- belong to Jesus not only by way of possession, and indeed the Father has given us to Jesus, and we'll come on to that next week, hopefully, in, chapter, in verse 29. Father, God the Father has given us to his Son, but we are his own by way of very special loving relationship. Oh, that one's my own. <laughs> that one's my own. We are his own, he cares, it matters to him about us. Jesus laid down his life for us because we matter to him, he cares for us, he loves us, we are his own. And we we can see it, we've already seen it in the fact that he knows our names, but look at verse 14, I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. me." You see, the heart of this is relationship, isn't it? I know them and they know me, they're my own, they're my own. Or as it's translated more literally in the ESV, 
I am the good shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me. They're special. They're very special. Set against the hard religion of the Pharisees and the fanaticism of the zealots, Jesus is the loving shepherd who has a very special relationship with his people. Set against the harshness of legalistic religions today or the fanaticism of extremists today or the dead emptiness of atheism today, Jesus, the good shepherd, is the good shepherd. Why, why listen to him? Well, isn't it obvious? He, he loves, he loves, he loves. But it goes deeper than where we've reached so far and it goes very, very deep and it goes wide too. Let's think about how deeply and I'm stretching beyond my capacity here, really, so I'm only just going to try to repeat what Jesus said and say very little more about it, because it is so profound. But look at verse 14 and 15. I am the good shepherd, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. This is too deep, I'm afraid, for me. But what Jesus seems to be saying here is this, that the mutual knowledge between himself and his people is compared to the mutual knowledge of the Father and the Son. So within the profound mystery of the Trinity, the perfect knowledge that the Father and the Son have of each other for eternity, before the world was ever made, Somehow there is a comparison made here between the knowledge of the son and the sheep. He loves very, very deeply. Just let that, well, you haven't got time to let that sink in. Before as we move on and see even more, verse 17. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. What the Lord Jesus appears to be saying here is this, not only the, the, the depth of the relationship between the Father and the Son can be compared with the relationship between the Son and us, but also the sacrificial love of Jesus for us is interconnected with the love of the Father and the Son. And when you think that God has existed forever, this, re this relational being that God is has existed forever and ever before the world was ever made, before the first human being ever existed in reality. This being existed forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, always has been and has been happy, contented, self-sufficient, for eternity, before ever any one of us, any, ever any human being existed made in his image to whom he would relate in a special way. But he was always happy. He was never lonely. Because forever and ever and ever he was like that. Eternity, always been, always existed. Because there is this precious relationship between Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They have a whole world of community in themselves, in himself. One God, three persons. It is, beyond, it's beyond, it is beyond our minds, isn't it? But if you feel uh, um, embarrassed of the doctrine of the Trinity, don't be. Because how could a God who is not that complex ever exist and be happy and content for eternity without anybody to talk to? How can a God who reveals himself so lovingly towards us as a heavenly father possibly exist for eternity without someone to love. Well, within the beauty of God's being, there is love and there is knowledge and there is community within himself. He, he is so complicated and way beyond our understanding, well, beyond my understanding anyway, you might be able to put me straight afterwards, but way beyond my understanding. But what Jesus is doing here is he's saying, look, the, the knowledge of the Father and the Son and the love between the Father and Son are all knitted together somehow or other with a relationship between Jesus and his people. <sighs> you know, 
put all that together, I'm, I'm just, I mean, frankly, it just blows my mind. Mercy, rescue, and grace towards us is the very heart of who God is. We don't need to feel lonely, cold, and unloved if we belong to Jesus. And we really must take Jesus seriously and listen to his recorded words, mustn't we? We must make sure we do seek to know him better and better and follow him more closely. Doesn't this show how important we are to God, how central we are to his plans and purposes? Doesn't it expose how wretchedly far short we fall from our calling when we disregard God? When we even deny he exists? Or when, as his children, we don't take much notice of him anyway? In reading his word, in meditating upon it, in communion with him, in prayer. Doesn't it reveal how we don't deserve God's loving kindness and patience towards us, but he so freely gives it? Doesn't it highlight the profound love of Jesus to lay down his life for us? Doesn't it make you want to listen to him? Doesn't it? And obey and follow. Well, that's something of the depth. Let's just quickly look at the breadth. Verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there'll be one flock and one shepherd. Listen to him. Why? Because he brings people together. It was hard for the Jews to think that anybody but a Jew could be one of God's children, one of God's people. And Jesus is saying, well, look, I'm not just interested in the Jews. I am interested in them, most certainly, but I have other people from around the world, even as far as Graves End. It's a wide, wide love. You don't have to be of a certain race to be one of Jesus' people. You don't have to be of a certain um, social standing, educational level. I have people, his people from all around the world, and he brings them together in one flock. Remember, as the wolf comes, if he is not um, fended off by the good shepherd, he scatters the flock. Well, Jesus' intention is to keep his people together. To gather his flock, there'll be one flock and one shepherd who protects them and keeps them together. It is a wide, wide love. Wide, wide as the ocean. Oh, listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus. And finally, he loves powerfully. Verse 18. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. His death was an act of loving obedience to his father's will. But it was also an act of profound personal power. No one took his life from him. No accident occurred. He didn't just take one step too far. He deliberately laid down his life and took it back again. He is the living Lord of life and love. Listen to him. What other possible shepherd, what other possible influencer, what other possible voice could we listen to that has the power and the love and the eternal um, care that Jesus has. He laid down his life deliberately and he took it back again. And therefore he is able to speak forever and to love forever and to care forever and to protect forever because he has power, the power of life in himself. Listen to him. Follow him. He has the power of life himself. Don't give up on him. Don't think you can find someone better to influence you. You never can. You'll never find a better answer to life. You'll never find another saviour. Which religious leaders in the world have la deliberately laid down their lives for their people and taken it back again? Which influencers would do that from the safety of their bedroom, producing YouTubes, not really knowing anybody that's watching them or listening to them? Listen to Jesus, read his words, believe him and obey him. If you think the universe is an empty, cold, lonely place, listen to Jesus. And you'll discover it's not. There is someone at home. The fire is lit. The door is open. 
and the heart, not just the half, but the heart of God, is warm and loving and caring. Listen, listen, listen to Jesus. Amen. Amen. We have a, a final song. I've lost my... Which, what is it? Oh, yes, I know. I remember what it is. What gift of grace. Let's, uh, let's stand up for this song. What gift of grace. dark, but I am not forsaken, for by my side the Savior he will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing, for in my need his power is displayed. To this I hold my shepherd I dread, I know I am forgiven, the future sure, the price it has been paid, for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon, and he was raised to overthrow the grave, to this I hold my sin.
that song <laughs> some of you do as well and I really like these verses that I'm going to read now as we close I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Amen.